I want to welcome you all to the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center is something to talk about, which is now sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone has innovative and compassionate care worth the wait. Call 360-271-2530 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments on Rolling Bay today. And I am very happy to welcome you today uh, to a discussion of land acknowledgements. Uh, this is something that is happening more and more in uh, organizations as a uh, recognition of the fact that uh, settlers arrived without uh, warning and without any uh, sort of acknowledgement of the fact that they were not the first people here. And so uh, we're starting to work on acknowledging the history uh, that goes before white arrivals. Um, and so I am grateful for uh, Anne Lovejoy, who is going to be facilitating today's program, and for Barbara Lawrence, who is joining us as well, uh, to help us work through this as part of the inclusion study group. And I would like to, uh, to start, if I may, by uh, reading a land acknowledgement that was provided by the Suquamish people. So I'm going to uh, share my screen, which should share the acknowledgement so you can uh, follow along with me. It starts with a quote from uh, Chief Seattle from 1854, saying that every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is within the ancestral territory of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea, as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquamish live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. Anne? Thank you, Reed. I would love to introduce to you Barbara Lawrence, who is Education Outreach uh, Since Time Immemorial Curriculum Program Specialist for the Suquamish Tribe. Uh, Barbara, welcome, and thank you so much for coming. <laughs> I'm psyched. I think, thank all of you for your patience. I don't think that I've ever sent out quite so many uh, notifications for a single event before, including ones that didn't include the time or the place. Um, but now I think we are all gathered together and very eager to hear more. Uh, Barbara tells me that she has handled questions of pretty much all kinds and has presented talks called things like everything you ever wanted to know about the Suquamish tribe but didn't want to ask. And so your questions, you could put them in the chat if you would. Um, rather than uh, interrupting, but we, we would welcome your questions as a way to guide our conversation today. Uh, Barbara, as I kind of have discussed with you a bit, uh, the Senior Center is very indeed willing and very interested in acknowledging that we are living and working on land that was uh, traditional tribal land. And one of the pieces that's come out in the last year or so as we've struggled to kind of create our own language was to say, well, we wanna use the language that the tribe has provided us, but after saying it over and over and over, we start to find that it doesn't have as much meaning as we would want it to, and are trying to look for ways to make it stay real. Does that make sense? Um. <clears throat> So you're not the first group that has said that to us and has then gone on to create their own. Um, we're deluged with requests for land acknowledgement statements um, over the last few years. And uh, we have what's called um, a cultural co-op, which, um, which is a group of tribal members and um, mostly employees of the tribe who are tribal members, including um, Leonard Forsman, the chairman, Tina Jackson, the cultural coordinator, 
um, there's there's a, a long list of people that belong to the cultural cooperative. The reason the cultural cooperative exists is because every um, October and November um, for, for decades, um, our tribe as most tribes are deluged with requests for, um, you know, singers and drummers and speakers, you know, whether it's um, Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, Thanksgiving, whatever. Um, so um, with, with hundreds and hundreds of requests, um, it was just too much for any one person. So we created the cultural co-op. So the cultural co-op looks over all requests and decides if there's something that we can do. And, um, uh, and it's not just that, there's big things like naming a ferry boat. So we, you know, threw ourselves into um, getting a ferry boat named Suquamish and that was the work of the cultural co-op. So, um, so it's big deal things as well as answering questions or, or showing up for some non-Indians events. When you um, consider writing your own, I mean, you can do whatever you want, but it's really easy to write something that makes sense to you and that um, offends the tribe. And, and it, it's just simple wording. It's, you know, it's what, what just seems um, easy and natural for non-Indians can, can step on some toes. And, and just here, I'll just give you an example. Um, I went to a training where um, the National Park Service was training Park Service employees and tribal members in the relationship between the tribes and the national parks. And this one presenter said over and over throughout his presentation, when this treaty was created and, um, you know, in wherever, Arizona, Colorado, wherever, and land was given to the tribe, Ooh. right? So, um, so I kept, I was looking in the room that was half native and half National Park Service people and they were just taking notes. And so I, I knew it was my responsibility to, I just kept raising my hand and kept correcting the um, presenter. And, um, and the non-Indian National Park Service employees got upset about halfway through saying, Who's the presenter? You know, why don't we just listen to the presenter? Well, I well, I can't just listen to somebody who gives bad or wrong information in 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 a classroom setting. So um so uh it you know if 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 that presenter wasn't welcome back the next year. So um so the specific wording of a document that talks about us and our land is, um, is important. Now, how important is a land acknowledgement? It wasn't a thing five years ago. It wasn't a thing 10 years ago. But what I can tell you is um, one, of, one of the jobs I had um, was being a cultural resource specialist. And what that person does is you're on site where there's ground disturbance in the traditional territory of a tribe. I happened to be working for a different tribe at that time and, um, and their reservation was um, tiny and, um, and there was a, several nearby towns and but one particular town that would often have um, construction by the waterfront. And so um, the law says that if there's construction by the waterfront that a tribal cultural resource specialist representing the tribe had to be on site and, and, the, and the people who were doing the work had to hire an archeologist to be on site. So, um, so whenever I would show up, <clears throat> this, this one person would say, the reservation's 12 miles that way, you know? And I'd say, well, thank you for those instructions. I'm here because of the ground disturbance happening here. So um, 
is there's the reservation and then there's the territory. And those, those two things are, um, they can't really be separated. Um, that basic education of what is a territory, what is land that belongs to a people is so important that, um, that you, you wouldn't believe how many people don't know that. Um, this land acknowledgement statement was carefully, carefully crafted and corrected many times. And so um, changed and modified many times so that it now finally is what the tribe is happy with. So if you were to create your own, you might want to send it to the cultural co-op to see if it's not offensive. I hope that doesn't hurt your feelings. Not at all. Thank you. No, I think that's extremely clear. And you're exactly right that those of us who are trying to make something more authentic to our experience are not necessarily looking at the experience of the tribe at all, because most of us do not really know it. And actually, that brings up another question for me. How can we best educate ourselves about the Suquamish tribal history? Because one thing that has always struck me is that it's really easy to invite somebody from the tribe like yourself to interrupt your day and your time and your work and come and educate us. And it's very much appreciated, but it also seems like we should do some of the digging ourselves. And so I'm curious if you have some suggestions about ways, I mean, we can go to, we're actually planning a senior center tour to the, um, to the Suquamish Museum. Mm -hmm. for the board and anyone else who's interested and we'd like to have more of a relationship because we're quite aware that we are on tribal land or what was ancestral tribal land if you just walk out the door of the senior center and walk down to the water there's a shell midden right there you know 100 yards away it's very clearly part of what was once a fishing camp um so how uh we can do some things ourselves for sure but i guess part of my question is, what's the most respectful way we can educate ourselves? Um, well, the first is Suquamish Museum and, and to hopefully have a guided tour of the Suquamish Museum um, because a guided tour will give you so much more. And then um, come back on your own and read everything that's written on the walls in the Suquamish Museum. Um, there's, there's a timeline wall it's, it's a wall that, um, it's a, there's words and there's pictures, but it's also woven. It, it, it itself is, is a piece of art and it's woven. Um, I don't know how else to ex ex say that, except that weaving is a huge part of our culture. And um, so that timeline wall, rather than having a line that, you know, this date and this date and this date, um, we created it as a weaving and the writing is really small. So bring your glasses and it takes a long time to, um, takes a long time to read that. I would say it takes a good hour to read, to read that and, and to soak it all in. And um, that information isn't given in the guided tour. So what you would get in the guided tour is a lot of really wonderful information, but not what's written on the timeline wall. So come back on your own and really dig into it. It's, it's full of an abundance of information. Um, then other things you can do is when there's, when there's public events and, you know, before COVID, we had a lot of public events and you could go to Suquamish Tribe's website and, um, and look at our public events. There's things that are for the tribal members only, and then there's things that are public events. And by coming to our public events, you would experience the tribe rather than just read about it. And, and there's some things that are absolutely characteristic tribe and not just Suquamish tribe, but tribe. I haven't been to any tribe where um, the elders weren't fed first, seated first, fed first, take care of, taken care of first. And, um, 
and I've been to lots of non-Indian events where that wasn't the case, <laughs> and um, and it's kind of shocking to me. So um, so experiencing our public events, some of them are virtual now because of COVID. So go to our website and look for those ones that are virtual because at least you could still see what's happening. Barbara, I've heard that the it looked like um, there were going to be some recorded, a series of four maybe of conversations or presentations that works somehow from the tribe and Hallsbo maybe, is that possible? I was just hearing this through one of the equity groups and they said, you know, stay tuned for more information and I haven't heard more about it. Um, so I don't know, but I could find out. I'll, I'll write that down as something to find out. So um, I'd like, yeah, knowing where to find out is really helpful because a lot of times we don't know where to look. Uh, so recorded conversations concerning? It, it sounded like they were gonna do a set of conversations that the public could attend that would be educational. Oh, yeah, okay, it's about sovereignty. Yes, and um, and there's they start in September, and um, and I I'm not sure if they're one a month, but um, but yes, I'm I'm involved in those. Um, I'll get you more information and send it to you so you can disseminate it to your your um audience. Great, thank you. I get sorry I explained it so badly. It took a while to get it, my point across. Um, but again, when we're not familiar we may not pick up on the right words to say or the right okay. it's okay yeah i um yeah it's yeah it's it's basically about sovereignty which is um why we exist really and sovereignty and um the the um everyone has some kind of sovereignty and we have sovereignty to this land so um I mean, we had sovereignty before the non-Indians showed up on the East Coast anyway. And, and this, those conversations will explain that. Inherent rights are inherent rights that we had from just being here, just being the first people separate from the treaties. You know, one thing I've noticed, I, I looked in the library to read up about Suquamish and found a couple of books about Indianola um, one from 1960s and an updated version from the 80s or 90s. And I was really struck by how patronizing and simplistic, uh, the, how quickly things were glossed over in terms of, well, here were these people who, they, they didn't say savages, but it was like, they were just beachcombers and they didn't really know. So we gave them, you know, the opportunity to farm. They could have 40 acres of uncleared woodland and they didn't do very well because they just didn't know what to do. So. But here was all this beachfront property. We couldn't just let that go to waste. We needed to, you know, exploit it and make sure it was a nice place for homes for Seattle people. And I thought, wow, how I just would love to believe that even at, in the 60s and even in the 80s and 90s, that language hit some people wrong, not just tribal people. But was there no pushback about that? I don't know. That's a really big question, a really big question. And um, um. So it wasn't given to us if that's what they're talking about. Um, it, it was it was Indianola was also one of our villages. I mean, there was more than one Suquamish village in what is now called Indianola, more, more than one. And um, and while it was a favorite thing for non-Indians to say that we weren't doing anything with it, um, what what we did was we worked inside inside nature's. Um, um, nature's rules. Like when it was time to go gather cedar, we gathered cedar. When it was time to gather berries, we gathered berries. When it was time to gather roots, we gathered roots. We And we didn't um, ever overgather from where any of these sites for any of these resources. So while they can say we were doing nothing with it, it's actually a compliment because they couldn't tell what we were harvesting and how much we were harvesting because we weren't harming it. We were gathering. So now, so I have a master's degree. And in, when I was in my master's program, 
I was overwhelmed with all these. I knew that these professors were speaking English, you know, but with, you know, as their paragraphs turned into pages and, you know, their, you know, a whole lecture of giant words, and I'm not a simple person, but they were words that I hadn't heard of before. Um, and I called my friend, who's Leonard Forsman, who already had his master's degree, and I said, I'm just kind of a, a little overwhelmed. I'm, I know I can do this. I just, they don't give a, um, I think they're making up words, <laughs> and they're not giving us a, um, a list of those, you know, and, uh, and he said, so he said, when you're in sustainability, which is what I, my program was sustainability, and he said, um, know that you already know that you already know everything that they're teaching you we just called it something different it's just keep referring to chief seattle speech keep referring to what the elders taught us when we were gathering berries or the cedar bark um, when they say sustainability when they say um uh, what's that other one um permaculture you know when any of those things that they're saying, we already were doing that before we were so rudely interrupted and, and forbidden to do that. You know, now, recently, uh, there, excuse me, I, uh, okay. there's been some research that found ancient gardens from that people didn't, people, researchers didn't recognize as gardens and refused right. to believe it for a really long time, but then finally started doing plant counts and recognizing that they had to be deliberately planted because there were way too many species in one place, but knit together so seamlessly that they lasted for literally hundreds of years in some situations. Mm -hmm. And when the elders explained that they were planted for perpetuity and they were planted for people and birds and bears, which I love that. And so now there's like all this interest in, wow, maybe they really did know something about sustainability and permaculture, but what an eye opener for people the scientific community that didn't didn't acknowledge or respect that ancient information at all. And I think it's so exciting that they're still here to be lessons on how to live a lot lightly, a lot less heavily on the land. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right, that when people harvest in tune with natural systems, it's not destructive. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to put, I can't, I don't know how and don't want to try to share screen, but if you could put up the map of the village sites and campsites, is that possible? Yeah, just give me a moment. I need to do a little uh, check of the email, but I will find it. Okay. And are there questions on chat that you want to refer to, Anne? I'm looking here and it says, um, does the culture committee at the tribe have a suggested honoraria for tribal members who generously give of their time and knowledge in responding to requests for speakers, dancers, singers, blessings, and other such resource, other such resource requests. Um, so when it's an individual, so they're not gonna ever say a number amount and I wouldn't ever say a number amount and neither would any of those people. They, um, what they want is to, um, so, so if it's singers and drummers and dancers, you know, that's got to be, you know, six, a dozen, 20, I don't know how many people. And um, most of these people have jobs. So however many are showing up are um, like taking a leave of absence or a sick day or something and, and doing what they're doing for the event. So um, I would say be as generous as your budget could allow for a group like that. And when it's an individual, whenever somebody asks me, um, like if I'm specifically storytelling, I have I have I have a rate for storytelling. Um, but for anything else, it's I just say whatever your budget can allow. Um, when storytelling, usually for school classrooms, um, it just breaks my heart when I open a thank you envelope and it's a personal check from a school teacher. And um, because I think that the teacher shouldn't have to do that, you know? And, um, and uh, whenever that happens, I call that person up right away and say, look, I'll come back a couple more times just because. Um, 
this, and, and at that same time, I want the schools to incorporate into their budgets, you know, the valuable resource of, you know, cultural educators coming in. Because I never really want it to be a teacher spending her own money, which happens quite a bit. So, um, yeah, any other questions in there waiting for? Yes. Uh, can we set up a group guided tour yet? Is the museum, of, can we do I, that? I don't work for the museum. Um, you can find that information out from looking at their, at their website or calling their number. Um, I just was looking in, this, the tribe has our own um, inside the tribe newspaper, not the newspaper that the public sees that's printed for the public. We have our own just for tribal members. And I was reading in there today and it was written a few days ago that the museum's open from nine to five. So um, it didn't say anything about no tours. So um, I would call them and ask them. You know, when, as the COVID um, branches off into strains and those strains become more dangerous, like Delta, I think that there's going to be more precautions taken. So they might limit it to however many people because it's not a large museum, they might limit it to however many people and require masks and all that. Makes total sense, thank you. Uh, there's another one, to whom and at what email should groups address questions about a revised land acknowledgement statement? Oh, that would be Tina Jackson. Um, she's the one who uh, coordinates the cultural co-op. So that would be T. Jackson at Suquamish.nsn.us, and that NSN is like Native Sovereign Nation, United States, not Microsoft Network. <laughs> so it's nsn.nsn.us. So pretty much all tribes have that same suffix for their email. So T. Jackson. I think Reed will put that in the, um, in the chat for people. And let's see, this is from Kristen Tollison says, since time immemorial is another way to start accessing essential learning through the state education system, tribes, including Suquamish, have augmented with specific information. Oh, she's giving a resource, sorry. About since, since time is, so I have two jobs, two halves of my job. One job is education outreach, like what I'm doing right now. And one job is as being the coordinator of writing the Suquamish tribes specific curriculum that goes to the state of Washington since time immemorial curriculum project. The state of Washington has a law that all the school public schools must teach sovereignty, the truth about tribes, the truth about the history, and the truth about sovereignty, including contemporary tribes today. And um, preferably the tribe whose land you're on. Mm -hmm. And um, so if once you get into that now, since time immemorial, there's 29, there's 29 reservations in the state of Washington. There's more tribes than there are reservations. And so, um, and so when they put together the sample curriculum, that doesn't mean it's not good. It's good curriculum, it's just sample. So when they put it together, they couldn't put it together for all the tribes that exist in the state of Washington. So, so the Suquamish tribe, and our treaty are not represented in since time immemorial. In this area, um, there's a point no point treaty and the, and the point Elliott treaty. The Suquamish are signers of the point Elliott treaty and the point no point treaty um, uh, is for the Sklalams of which there's three different bands and, um, and then the Skokomish and I want to say Nisqually. I don't want to make a mistake here. I'm not sure who all are in their treaty, but um, we but we are not, and theirs was focused on. So you won't find lessons in there about us until we put them there. And mm -hmm. um and so we are. Oh, and here's the other thing: is it's this how the law was written? Is the schools were resp are responsible to um, work with the tribes consult with the tribes, get information from the tribes, and the schools are responsible to write the curriculum and submit the curriculum. 
we worked with some schools that shall go nameless and um, for years to get give them information, have them in front of people. And um, here, here at Suquamish and the curriculum that was written was not representative of what we, um, I, think, I think they did their utter best. I think it's impossible for non-Indians to write about us and do, and, and do it well. I mean, some have, but that's their job. I mean, some have, but this didn't work out. So we decided that since we had all the brains and the ability and the, res the financial resources, um, so the law was written so that it wouldn't be a financial drain on the tribes. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a burden to the tribes. It's a burden of the schools. It's their responsibility and they should be paying for it. And there's other tribes who wouldn't have the resources to do what we're gonna do. And, and we just created the, we just completed the seventh grade um, geography and treaty time lesson plan and just put it out there. And so, um, and so now we'll be going to um, other, other lessons. I'm not sure, I, I heard kindergarten and I heard 12th grade. I don't know what, um, one of one of those is going to be next, and then we're just going to keep going until they'll they'll all be written, um, created. Some of them are some of them are um, um, how do you say interactive. So so um, if you went to since time immemorial, you wouldn't find anything about us except the seventh grade one that we just just barely like two weeks ago put it out put it out there. Um, but yeah, anybody can go to Since Time Immemorial website, which is inside the Superintendent of Public Instruction in the Office of Native Education. So um, you, you can find that and you can, you know, peruse all those lessons. It's all good information. You just aren't gonna learn about Suquamish that way. Well, that's awesome, thank you. That sounds like the tribe is making a huge investment in education for everyone. There's not a lot. There's not a lot written by Suqu about Suquamish people, so we're doing it. And I'm um, Leonard Forsman, who's our chairman, who's also um, anthropologist, archaeologist, um, has a master's degree. He's he's brilliant, and he wrote the lesson. He wrote the paper that goes with the lesson for the seventh grade. He's probably going to write each of them because he's that gifted, and. Um, I could probably send that to you guys because it is complete. And um, so I'll, I'll send it to Anne and, um, and she can send it out to you guys. So you'll actually be reading Leonard's, Leonard's um, paper that we built the lesson around. Oh, that'd be fascinating. Thank you. And there are, by the way, a number of high school students and teachers who are part of this program. So you would be, it would be going to the teachers directly as well. Um, that's where the map came from, the, the, um, the map of the villages that, um, that Reed's going to put up is oh. from that lesson. And here it is. There you go. So um, I know it's, I know it's um, small, um, and I'm hoping some of you already printed it out and have it for your, um, for your personal use. Um, the red lines are the, the Port Madison Indian Reservation. And, um, and the, so we, we refer to it here on the, in the tribe, we refer to it as the two halves, the um, Suquamish half and the Indianola half, even though Indianola is just a little you know, speck there, um, but that's just the easiest way to refer to it. And I want you to um, notice at the very top, there's a 33, um, each thing, each one that's, um, that's um, an actual number on here is a village site. And, um, and then the yellow dots are campsites. Now, there was heated conversation, heated conversations about um, what's the difference between a village and a campsite. Because, so say, say you live in, on Bainbridge Island, but you have a home in Florida and you go there and you live there during the winter. What, does anybody call that a campsite? 
So, um, so our people would leave the longhouse. We, we'd live in the longhouse villages, this main structure that, you know, that when you look at it, you know, that's a, that's a building because they're huge. So we'd leave the, we'd live in the longhouse in the winter and spring, summer and fall, we would leave it. We wouldn't be there in the spring, summer, fall. We would be out at all these places, um, any number of these places to do whatever gathering and, and um, storing, um, drying or, you know, um, smoke drying or what have you of this, these products. It could be, we could be weaving and carving and, you know, wherever, wherever these, whatever this campsite is um, prominent for. So it might be for berries, but it might be for shrimp, but it might be for the perfect trees to fall for, to make um, canoes out of. So we would be at, and, and it might be several of those things, and it's just the right time to be at that place. Where you see the 33 and the arrow going up, that is a place, that is a, um, um, that is a, camp and I and I'm one of the ones that says no it's also a home um it's a, a camp that Chief Chalicum it's a name that you won't have heard about often until we get more writing done Chief Chalicum was a predecessor to Chief Seattle and um he um he had more than one village and the one that's 33 is up on Whidbey Island it's on the southern end of Whidbey Island, and there he had a very impressive um, meadow or valley or pasture land or whatever that that he um, that was um, for um, potatoes and um, roots, um, camas. Um, that's that's it was that's what was in store there, and so much so that. It was known for that. And so as, as Southern as, um, well, and we deliberately don't have names of towns here so that, or the islands or anything because we wanted the people to see how, we wanted you to know it by these places instead of um, by, by non-Indian towns. But if you look at the scattering of these dots, um, South and East and, um, over on the Hood Canal and over on the Seattle side and e Everett and um, Mercer Island. Um, these are all, these are all very, very important places to us. And it's not that they were very important. They are very important. I'm, I might say, I might talk past tense when I'm referring to Chief Chalicum and his places or um, Chief Kitsap and what happened at a certain place, but the places remain Suquamish and they remain um, important to us. Now, when I say Suquamish, that's another thing. Um, and I'm trying to mind the clock wherever it is. Um, um, there was only one village that was called Suquamish. All the rest of them had their own name, each their own name. Um, we, we were not known as a people, as a people with one name until the until the reservation, until the treaty and the reservation. Each one of these main villages, they each had their own name and they were valid names. And, um, <clears throat> and the villages would come together if necessary for, um, for war to defend our villages or to, um, or to go to war against someone who had repeatedly come to you know, attack our villages. Um, or for celebrations and ceremonies, which are usually in the um, winter time. We knew we were one people. We knew we were under the leadership of whichever leader, like Chief Seattle or Chief Chalicum or Chief Kitsap, but we didn't have one unifying name and that wasn't a problem for us. It wasn't a problem for us at all. It was a problem for the non-Indians. And so they kind of had to pick one and so um, it, it became Suquamish, which is fine by us. It's just, um, it just happens to represent one of the villages. It now represents all of us. So Barbara, may I ask, 
now that I'm seeing sometimes different places are saying, oh, we want to allow the tribe to come back and do harvesting. How? <laughs> so, um, it, when I mean, when people are saying it, we're not going to get mad at them for saying a wrong word here and there. It's a process of education, and we want we want our allies. We want all of our allies, and and if they're our allies and they're struggling with those words, we'll just gently teach them. You know, we'll just we'll just gently like all of this is our territory. It, it wasn't our ancestral territory, it is our territory. And that, um, and that we were here for thousands and thousands of years and that there's like this little interruption of what, you know, 100 years, 150 years, whatever. It, it's still, it's still that much, it's still ours. Mm -hmm. And, um, the phenomenon of paying money for something and then calling it that you own it is not something that we get too hung up on. If it was ours for 10,000 years, 20,000 years, 30,000, 50,000 years, and somebody thinks they own it, it's just a misunderstanding, you know? Now we're gonna respect that, but anything that was stolen from us we have no problem buying it back and, you know, bringing it back into the fold, which is what we, um, which is what we're doing. Right. I see. We, uh, I think that is actually a beautiful attitude. It's <laughs> very, I think uh, you really have a lot to teach about compassion and forgiveness, but moving forward, it, that's a huge important lesson that our culture as a whole does not get very easily. There's a couple more questions. Um, how would you recommend acknowledging Aboriginal tribal land when addressing a group on Zoom that spans participants from many states or countries? Um, I don't quite understand the question. I think what she, what she means is sometimes you're in a Zoom call and it might be not, you know, we're, you might, we might say we would like to acknowledge that we're on um, the tribal, Aboriginal tribal land of the Suquamish people. But I guess she's saying maybe some people are there from England or maybe some people are there from Minnesota or whatever. But would it be appropriate to go ahead and say it because it's that's where we are? Yeah, who's ever doing the talking is who's who's ever doing the talking. You're talking about where you're at, and if the people from Minnesota want to acknowledge the um, the um, um, Menominee, mm -hmm. I think I'm I'm just pulling that out of my head. <laughs> I know that I know that there's a lot of I know Menominees do a lot of wild rice. So um in Minnesota has a lot of lakes and so maybe that's where they're from. I could be wrong. But um who's ever whoever wants to do that can do that from where they're at about the people that um that are the and we don't say or Aboriginal. That was a staff person wrote that for us and we changed it. The um cultural co-op changed it. And what would you prefer? Well, what we have on our, what we have on our, the ones that I sent you, uh -huh. um, it says ancestral territory. There was one online on our site that a staff member wrote and, um, and we've changed it and I've sent those four uh -huh. to you and it says ancestral because Aboriginal just confuses people. They think you're in Australia or Canada. And um, so we're, it's ancestral territory. Great, thank you. Another question is, are independent schools required to teach about Native peoples? Independent, um, um, and it says Washington state law. So a Washington state law, anybody that has to mind the state laws. Um, I don't know what private schools or independent schools are required to mind or not. I, I don't know that answer. I do know that all public schools 
in the state of Washington have to follow the law. But sharing curriculum with teachers from private school would be perfectly appropriate if they wanted Absolutely. to use it. We want everybody to know. Yeah. We, want, we want everyone to know. We, we, we would share it with anybody. I, as soon as the map was made, I asked permission to share it widely. And um, it's, I mean, it, the map is a huge hit with the tribal membership because most of them didn't know how big our territory was. So, um, yeah, and I think for kids to look at it in school situations, and I love that you started without the colonial names, but just look at the territory, look at this map, look at all the places, and then start putting it together, make a great field trip, like for years, mm -hmm. <laughs> to go to so many of those places and acknowledge what they were. We're gonna try, um, and I, I hear one of my, one of my coworkers says, um, there is no try, right? We, we are going to do some um, historical photographs of a place and the contemporary photographs of a place and connect it to those numbers. And then the historical names, the names that we have that our people have called those places. And um, yeah, so um, it'll be, it'll be far more, it's going to grow the, um, the, it's not just going to stay stagnant. It's going to grow with more and more information as we, as we have the time to do it. I think that's a great project because I think about, there was a one for many years called Seattle Then and Now that ran in some of the papers, but the then was only about, you know, 50 years after colonialism had started. So they don't really show a then then, and it might be amazing to have whatever records there might be of real thens. Uh, to show what we stepped all over. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's another question. Um, Teen, do you have do you have a word to suggest instead of invite, allow, permit for groups that currently see themselves as landowners who could use to acknowledge openness, welcoming Suquamish gatherers to harvest on a particular land? Is there a better gracious way? Oh, to I think she or whoever said that already said it, inviting and permitting. Um, inviting is, is a really nice word. Mm -hmm. Inviting is a, is a good kind word. The um, Navy base, um, well, Navy base Bangor and um, uh, Navy base, um, Keyport, maybe? No. Anyway, um, they invite us regularly to places to gather when they know they're going to modify the landscape a lot, meaning cut some trees or, or um, some bushes that have berries that we like are going to, you know, they're going to build something and those are going to be gone. So they'll call us and say, do you want to come over? And then, you know, there's a whole process of being invited to the to the base, and um, and so we we like that we like that relationship. It sounds like a good one to in introduce to developers. <laughs> and there are some developers that have um, when you're on your way to Silverdale on what we call the old way, not the freeway, um, and you're coming down that down that hill, um, and the skate park is on your right, and the I, and I'm going to say new, new development is on your left, on your driver's side. Um, but when that was all trees, um, we were invited in by that developer to um, get as much cedar bark as we could from all those cedar trees and, um, and, and cedar roots and, you know, limbs, because we use, we use the roots and limbs as well. We use everything of the cedar tree. We use everything of the everything um, when we're harvesting. And um, it might be medicine, it might be food, it might be packaging, it might be, you know, structural. So um, we were invited by that, by that um, developer. And yes, we love to be invited by when, you know, when you can't stop something from happening, at least you can and, and I'm not saying we want to stop everything from happening, but there are there are places that we don't that we you know will throw our bodies in front of a bulldozer. There are those places, and um, 
but otherwise, um, we definitely want to gather as much of the shoots and roots and berries and bark that we can from places that are going to be changed. What about for homeowners who have big properties? Would it be there's people, there's people that have called us and said, there's a tree that's, there's a cedar tree that's gonna fall someday on our house, the arborist says. So um, we ask them to ask their arborist if it can wait till May. So it's May, it's June, it's when the, it's when the dogwood blooms. So when the dogwood blooms is when we can get cedar bark. So, um, which might be May and it might be June, but as, as um, climate change is happening, things are happening in different times now. So um, we, if they're gonna, if anybody has to fall cedar trees, if they can hold off till after cedar bark time, that would be great. We would love to, there's never enough cedar bark to gather. So we would love that. Oh, I'll definitely put that in a garden column. <laughs> Cause I think a lot of people would like to feel like, you know, if you have to take a tree down, and I think a lot of them come down that don't have to come down, but that's another conversation. But if you have to bring it down, at least it could be like given in service, given like honoring the life of the tree by getting good use. Right. And like I say, the limbs too, the limbs and the roots. So there's a lot about a cedar tree. Um, there's, um, and it's, we now have just a few minutes left and I wanted to say that there have been a number of people who have been moved to um, include us in their will and leave their land, leave their, leave their land to us or leave their house to us, um, their lot or whatever they have. And um, because it was inside our reservation or inside our territory. And um, that's been pretty moving to us because we're used to buying, we're used to buying it you know, and in, in competition with others. And so, um, and so if anybody was inclined to do that, we would be thrilled um, to bring back land that was, I'm not saying anybody who has it now, it's stolen. I'm saying that's how it got, right. that's how it got there was it was stolen. And we could spend a whole nother session talking about that and I, could explain it in detail and show it in writing how that dubious thing happened um, so that we had almost no reservation. And so we now just have over 51% right now of our reservation. There's um, 1,200 Suquamish tribal members. Um, not all of us live here. So I would say maybe a third of us live here. There are 7,000 non-Indians on our reservation who own, you know, 49% of our reservation. That's just a reservation. And that's not talking about the territory. Right. <laughs> that's just a reservation. So, um, so um, any of that land that comes back to us um, by donation is pretty thrilling. And I would say it's probably happened like three times. And, um, and that was before land acknowledgement was a thing. That was something those people found in their heart and soul, you know. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, one more question that we might have time for. Uh, what conversations, if any, do you know about taxing non-Native owners to give, I'm doing this because that's what she did, to give gratitude for living in Suquamish territories, even if it's voluntary until it would be a new system? I don't know anything about that. I know that... Um, these people who call themselves the Duwamish um, uh, over there in Seattle are, are asking people to pay rent, pay real rent to the Duwamish longhouse. And um, if anybody just reads our treaty, reads the, the um, Point Elliott Treaty, the first tribe mentioned is the Duwamish. And, um, and so they are recognized. So all of you, however many hundred people listening, um, Duwamish are recognized. They've always been recognized. They're recognized. There's no doubt about it. They're in the treaty, they're recognized. And they were to come to the Suquamish reservation and most, um, I'd say about a third of them did. 
and are here and are, are here and have been here. And then, um, and then some of them stayed in Renton and Kent, which is not Seattle, and and wanted their reservation there. And um, and uh, what became Renton and Kent. And um, the government said, no, but here's another reservation and it's the Muckleshoot Reservation, which is also a um, confederation of multiple tribes. And so another third of them went there. And then another, the last third of them went to Puyallup. So they are on three reservations where they belong. And, um, and it's one family, it's only one family who are enrolled Suquamish here um, who are doing all that over in, over in Seattle saying we're not recognized and we're the first people of Seattle and we need our reservation here in Seattle. So no, it's not true. They are recognized, it's in the treaty. They're on three reservations, they're taken care of. So all that is about a family who wants a reservation in Seattle, where they're not from anyway. They're from Kent and Renton area. So that's a long answer to a short question because of the real rent in Seattle and the taxing over here. I don't know, I haven't heard anything like that over here. Um, I know it's not something that we talk about. Well, this has been so incredibly rich, Barbara. I thank you so much. And it looks like if you would ever be willing to come again, we could probably come up with a few hundred more questions for you. Absolutely. Um, we definitely are going to pursue when we are able to have a guided tour to the Suquamish Museum for the board of the Senior Center, as well as anybody who wants to come. But it sounds like what we might probably should do is make it an all day occasion so that we would go on the tour, maybe have lunch, come back and take our time and really spend the time looking um, at the woven history on the walls that you'd mentioned before. That's really, really important. And, um, and thinking about you guys being seniors and some people not even being able to stand for that long or walk for that long. Um, let me see what I can do about getting the, the wording from the, from the wall. See, let me see what I can do about getting it sent to you. What if somebody were to make a little video of it? You wouldn't be able to see it. No. No. But I let me see what I can do about getting it. I'm not. I'm still saying go there and have the experience because you have to. There's also there's also what's called the walking cultural tour. So you'd walk. They give you a little map and some several pages of of written information, and you walk from the museum to Chief Seattle's grave, which is across the street and down a little. And, and then you read what's there in the handout. And then across the street from there um, to the Veterans Memorial and you read what's there and then down the hill to the House of Awakened Culture and the Canoe House and um, to the Charles Lawrence Memorial. And um, I would absolutely volunteer to be your guide on the walking tour. Oh my gosh, we will take you up on that so it's, fast. The walking tour is, is um, very, very meaningful. I see two people have their hands up. One of them is Akuye. Do you, Karen, do you want to say something? She's all the way across the country, so it's a long distance conversation. Karen, you're Hello, muted. Barbara. Hi, hi, Karen. Hi, I'm over here with the Mansion Tucket Pequot over oh, in, wow. um, yes, in, in uh, Mansion Tucket. So I'm right outside of Norwich, Connecticut. And it's so good to see you, Miss Barbara. This was very, and when I say very, educated, mm -hmm. and it was also culturally relevant when you were speaking about ancestral, you know, um, the lands and the prehistory preceding European settlement, it's so vital and so important. And, and you know, I just want to commend you for all the work that you're doing to preserve that culture, to ensure that culture is, is being preserved, the artifacts, as well as the different um, things that, that you all are cultivating. So I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you 
for all your work, Miss Barbara, because um, you are actually um, one of the words that I always use for you. You you are um, a, a cultural custodian. Oh, thank you. It's so good to see you, Karen. Yeah. And that's, that's beautiful. beautiful. Thank you so much. Katie, you have your hand up. Thank you, Akuye, for saying that because Barbara, it, this was absolutely wonderful. And you are a cultural custodian, you're a cultural um, mediator <laughs> and liaison. And um, I, of course, can't thank you enough for all of the ways that you've supported things um, that we've worked on together. And I just love um, just a moment to share just because of what Akuye said was, you know, that idea of what, you know, just like it's ridiculous that history starts on one side of the country, you know, that whole idea. And so since we're talking about systemic, uh, you know, racism these days and equity, it's so critical to remember that history does not start on the East Coast. <laughs> and I wanted to let people know that um, Barbara is going to do the honor of being right here again, 1130 to 1230 on Indigenous Peoples Day. Nice. And she's going to be speaking about her father's experience and her experience of having a father in the residential schools. So I just thought this group might want to really know that. So Barbara, thank you. This was wonderful. And, and thank you so much. I want to just add one tiny thing, which is that uh, you can join the Suquamish Museum for $10 a year, which gives you free unlimited entry and a discount in the unique gift shop according to Robin Hunt, and I believe it. And I think our whole board is gonna definitely join just to support this wonderful endeavor. Barbara, thank you so much. You have really enriched us. You're so welcome.